Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this uh, version of the Voice of the Bride webinar, webinar number 73, I believe it is. Um, continuing our study on the book of Revelation, you know, uh, we, we shifted our gears just a little bit last time because, um, you know, we're not doing them live as we were. So I'm going to do a little different format than I have in the past, probably take... Um, take less time per webinar, but maybe in the end, go into the segment uh, of each church age a little bit deeper, take one or two points per webinar and really uh, ground it and talk about it quite a bit. And probably in the end, uh, cover more territory, cover more of, of the, um, the history and, and the different um, um, messengers and the message and the spiritual climate and all that goes with that. So I think in the end, doing it this way, we may actually cover some more territory, but I won't do uh, each webinar with probably 30, 40 minutes uh, max as opposed to the live. We've already had a number of people you know, commenting they like the live format, and we will go back to that. Um, it's just depending upon my strength and you know where I am, which uh, brings me to the point. I'll share just a very, very brief update where I'm, I'm doing much, much better. Um, I'm doing a lot of natural things. I think, I think in the last webinar, I told everyone that um, met with the orthopedic surgeon and he went through his outline of what he wanted to do and we rejected that. We just said, we're not doing it. Um, if we did everything that he wanted to do, I would be laid up for about a year to a year and a half. He said probably closer to a year and a half, and that's unacceptable. Um, so we're believing God. We're thanking folks for prayer every single day. People are writing in, asking how things are, and we are incredibly grateful for those of you that do that. We're especially thankful for those of you that help us financially. Um, it seemed like we've been through this, you know, the furnace here for a few years, but the goodness and love of God's people has kept us going. But I got to be honest, I, you know, I, I say this often and, and, you know, but something is brewing. Something is up. Something is about to happen on planet Earth. And, and I feel it more now than I've ever felt it. And, and um, you know, it's, it's what I believe we've been prophesying. I, I really believe it's what we've been prophesying. I'll tell you what I like to do. Let me just tell you what I've had the vision of doing. And this is why I know we'll go back to being, being live. And I've seen this. I've seen this prophetically. But, but the, the day is approaching. I'm going to step out here for just a minute and prophesy a little bit. Um, and, and maybe maybe take a few people by surprise about what I'm going to say. But I am telling you, the Lord has told me that I will sit in this chair and I will look into that camera and I will, and by the grace of God, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, call out people's names and deal with their issues and their brokenheartedness and their oppressions and their sicknesses. The Lord is going to do Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. That's, that's the prayer right now. I'm saying that for myself every day. You should say it for yourself every day. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To buy. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted. The Lord has sent us to bind the brokenhearted. So why are there so many brokenhearted people? We're not doing our job. We're not doing our job. People should be lined up getting healed of brokenheartedness. This, this generation is an epidemic of brokenheartedness of, of every caliber. And I, you know, I'm, I've experienced some brokenheartedness. I have had to turn to people. <laughs> I called a friend of mine this morning, you know, Steve Shelley, my buddy, my pastor buddy. I, I said, Steve, you know, I, you know, pray for me. You know, I, I don't mind going to a brother and saying, listen, I need a little prayer myself. You know, I'm on the front line and get a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, warfare and neg negative dreams. That was really what I was asking him to um, pray over that that the enemy was trying to just uh, bring different kinds of dreams that upset me that were unsettling. 
and uh, and I asked him to pray over me just so, so that the enemy would not be able. To, and I said, if it's God sending those dreams, then help me understand them. Number one, if it's the enemy sending the dreams, then this seal the door. So we need to be able to have the power and the capacity to to bind the brokenhearted. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me. Acts 10.38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And He went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil. You're going to hear me quote Acts 10.38 a hundred times between now and the next few months. And so we're doing it because I saw that in a vision on July the 24th. I saw it in a vision. An angel took me to a place in this experience and he showed me that God is about to release on a company of people. Let me see if I want, I almost said something a little, I want to word it carefully. It, it, it won't be on everybody. I'm going to go ahead and say it the way I started to the to beginning. It'll be on those that have been willing to be prepared. God showed me that God is about to anoint some people with Acts 10.38, those that had been willing to be pulled aside into a cocoon of His presence. You might call it the secret place. And have allowed Him to, to do in them what needed to be done to carry that anointing. Acts 10.38, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for He has anointed me. God has anointed me with the Holy Spirit and with power to go about doing good and healing all, all who were oppressed of the devil. The Lord turned no one away, anyone with faith to be, to be healed, set free. He healed them. He, he bound their broken hearts. He, he opened their blind eyes, etc. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to captives. The recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those that are oppressed. You can just jump, jumble those three right in together. And, 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 and you have a ministry right there. To set at liberty those that are oppressed. Do you know anybody who's not oppressed? <laughs> I didn't say, do you know anybody oppressed? I said, do you know anyone that's not oppressed? I don't mean to say that lightly. I'm not meaning to make a, you know, a joke. I'm, I'm sure there are people that are not oppressed, but I, I get calls from Christians and letters and, you know, that are oppressed. Why is the church oppressed? I'm sure there's a community of people out there that are not. And praise the Lord for those. I mean that sincerely. And if you're not oppressed, you need to be out laying hands on the, pain, on the people that are and, and, and setting the captives free to set at liberty those that are oppressed. The recovery of sight to the blind and that not only, yes, natural blindness, but also there needs to be this anointing that we carry to this generation where we break the blindness of tradition and the blindness, and that's kind of part of what we talk about here in the Philadelphian church age, which is what we're going to get to here in just a moment. But I want to go ahead and go with this little flow here for just a moment. But, uh, but, but to, to, to set at liberty those that are, that are captive that the, and, and to the recovery of sight to the blind, those that are blind to religion, blind to... to um, um, human reasoning and even doctrines of demons. And let me just step out on the limb a little bit. I'm not going to be as strong about it right now until I get my physical strength back, but I've got to comment, you know, um, because I get the calls and, and, and to be honest, here we are. We're right in the middle of the churches of, of, of Asia Minor. Anyone that has been following uh, this ministry and these webinars, we know that we have been following the church that, the, that Jesus Christ called the Jezebel church. Jesus called it that. Jesus said there was out there a church that was identified by, the, by this woman Jezebel. It's in the Bible. So if the Lord said there's a church out there that's identified as Jezebel, it's, it, it would behoove me 
It is my prerogative. It is my responsibility to take the Bible and open it, read it to see what identifies it, find it, and stay as far away from it as I possibly can. I hope you heard what I just said. Stay away from it as far as I possibly can. Once I identify this false Babylon, you know, mystery Babylon, the great harlot, the Jezebel church, these are terms the Bible uses. It's a counterfeit spirit. It's not Islam. That is against God, but it is not counterfeit Christianity. It's not Hinduism or Buddhism. It's another form of Christianity or something that goes by the name. You, th you say you're a Jew, but you're not. It's what the Bible says. You say you're one thing, but the heart of what you represent says you're something else. That's what the Bible says. And here we, we just came through the Sardis church age. You know, we, we've identified these, these spirits that have empowered the early church to confront the spiritual dynamics of the day. They are the four living creatures. The lion. Well, I start first with the, with the lion. That's, uh, that's what I said, didn't I? The lion, the ox, the, the, the image of the man, and then, of course, the flying eagle. And the flying eagle anointing we'll spend quite a bit of time on because it is the Laodicean church, and it is our age. It is the 20th and 21st century church. We're actually moving out of Laodicea into kingdom now. But you see the lion age in the early church, and we covered that very extensively through the prior webinars, and I'll not take time here. And then we covered the age of martyrdom, a very long, brutal, ugly, bloody, horrible phase of church history where, where in the name of Christianity, people were brutalized and, and beaten and, and butchered in the worst ways possible. I'm, that's not my opinion. Read the history. Read the history for yourself. There is a wealth of information out there validating. In fact, I started putting some of it together and maybe I'll publish it, but I have something like 30 or 40 pages of documented evidence of persecutions through that 1260 year span of church history, probably coming from as many as 10 or 15 different historical uh, documents, books, historical books that I researched, spent a lot of time, spent hours researching these books, extracting from them, uh, from, from their research, the numbers of people that were, that were, that were murdered and tortured and Entire villages just wiped away uh, by, the, by the, the, the Roman church during the Dark Ages. And then, of course, you know, the, the, the image of the man was the beginning of the Reformation. We covered that with the Church of Sardis and the Church of Philadelphia. And we're, and we're, we're talking about Philadelphia now in this session, where you're still under the influence of the anointing of the man. Why? Because the, the, the common person, the common believer had been without the scriptures for a, over, a, over a thousand years. It was in places illegal to even own a Bible. And when they were able to go to a church service, they heard the scriptures read in a language they didn't even understand. There can be nothing further from the heart of God. There could be nothing further from the heart of God than for a priest to stand in front of hungry parishioners and read the Bible in a language he knew they couldn't even understand. How cruel. How cruel. <clears throat> Excuse me. How cruel could that be? There are people out there dying on the vine, as we say. Perishing, just like we were just talking about. Broken hearted, oppressed, needing a word from God. And the priest sits up there and reads it in a language they can't even understand. The answers for, for their dilemmas of life were right there. And the, and, the, and the church, the clergy, withheld it from the people. 
Now, you, you might say you're being a little harsh. I am not. You can read it for yourself in the history. <laughs> I'm just quoting history, friends, and it will upset people because they want to gloss over the history. They do. And then we have these incredibly brave reformers who at the risk of their own life, you know, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door. And if you'll remember, we covered that. And he was actually hoping to reform the Catholic church, but in, instead it created a whole new movement. So it wasn't really his, according to what we read, his initial intent was to reform the existing Catholic church. Instead, he created a whole new movement called the Protestant Reformation, the reformation of the faith, getting back to the scriptures where the number one thing, the premise for salvation was restored to the people. That by faith are you, are you saved. You're, the just shall live by faith. Our sins are washed away by faith, not by the paying of indulgences. That was the number one issue that Martin Luther had, that, that the church, the Roman church, had the audacity to sell salvation, to sell the forgiveness of sin. There can be, in my mind, nothing more of a reproach than to take the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ where he died for our sins and to remove that reality from the sense of the, from the reality of the people, the revelation of the people and say, listen, you come to me and pay, you know, what, ever how much money you can afford and we will grant you your forgiveness of sins. How, how hideous, how horrible. We have no mercy for that. No mercy for that. That was the most heinous. It was criminal for people to want to come to God for the forgiveness of sins, only to find out from some priest they had to sell their cow or what little pieces of silver they had in order to buy the forgiveness of sins when the forgiveness of sins was freely paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So yes, we need to be a little energized about some of this. We need to know the history. We need to know the history. Why? For some reason, people are wanting to partner back up with that very thing. And I, I, I don't get it. I, I don't see it. And I, I'm not going to be too, too, uh, too vocal on this right now because I need a little more physical strength to deal with the consequences. <laughs> But um, I cannot agree with that. I'll just say that. I cannot agree with these alliances that are being drawn up. I believe in unity. I do. I want unity. We will have the unity of the faith. We will. Ephesians 4 says it will happen. And it will be around the revelation of Jesus Christ. It will not be based on compromise. It will not be based on some denomination agreeing to agree. It will be based upon a body of people that have the spirit of the living God residing in them and they see by the Holy Spirit the revelation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They see not only that the just shall live by faith, they see not only the basic principles of our faith, they see beyond that into the very secrets of the kingdom of what will empower them to become the the beautiful, radiant, spotless, sinless bride of Christ, as well as the empowered sons of the kingdom. There, we, there is your unity right there. That revelation of this living word. It's the living word. And, and it's not going to be found in, in organizations that are going to have a board meeting and who agree to agree or to agree to disagree. That's not where this is coming from. It's just not, friends. You can't find that in the Bible anywhere. I don't mean to be, to be different. And, you know, I, I respect, I truly respect some of these leaders that are meeting with the Catholic church. I respect them as individuals, but I cannot agree. I'm sorry. I cannot as a ministry agree. Of course, I'm just a little bitty ministry, you know, here, but, but for those of you that follow us, and follow, if you have any confidence in what we have to say, you know, I can't agree with that. That's not the kind of unity we're looking for. I think that's good. In the end, if you just let that thing play itself out, 
you'll find that it's going to become a huge, huge mistake. A huge mistake. What we are looking for right now is what I was describing a moment ago. A body of people upon whom the Spirit of the Lord has fallen. And there's going to be a, a little army of people that have been from every corner of the earth. And they're going to respond to that anointing when these men and women who have been through the furnace, they will have been. This anointing that's coming is not, has not been, it is costly. It is costly. I advise you to buy of me gold refined by fire. This character that has been necessary, this character that has become necessary to carry the anointing God is wanting to put in the church today to go take us into 2018 and beyond is costly. I advise you to buy of me gold refined by fire. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I apologize for that. I, I advise you to buy of me gold refined by fire and white garments. You have to have white garments. You can't have stained garments. Gar this is, you know, the Bible says right here, I'm going to just kind of incorporate the Philadelphian church age with what, with what, uh, you know, my message, as I said before, these messages now, the way the format I'm doing will be somewhat different. But it says to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, the Philadelphian church is a church of brotherly love. He, talking about the Lord, who is holy and who is true, who has the key of David. He's holy and he's true. He has white garments, truth. If you have a stained garment, that means you have embraced a lie. The bride of Christ is without spot and without wrinkle. That means there has been a washing of her garments by the spirit of truth. By the spirit of truth. Body of people coming on the scene anointed with the Holy Spirit and power according to Acts 10 38. Who also bring with them and validate with them a message. Now here is the thing. People are things have been so difficult. The, the spiritual climate of 2016, 17, and, and 18, the spiritual climate of the 21st century, you can even say, has been so tumultuous. There has been so much spiritual warfare. There have been so many spiritual conflicts. There has been such a release of the demonic of deceptions, of deceiving spirits, spirits masquerading as Christianity. There has never been a day when you have had more counterfeit spirits masquerading as the true anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible says that, the, that, the, that even the elect would be, de, would be deceived if it were possible. It's not possible. The elect won't be deceived because they have something on the inside that says, no, 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 that looks really good, but something's not right. <laughs> you know what that's called? The sperm seed of God. That's what it is. The Bible says, he that believes in him, in him dwells the seed of God. And that seed will not allow that little bride of his to embrace a lie. We might wander down a road for a little piece, but we'll get pulled back because what's in us won't let us stay there. They, it just won't let us stay there because it's woven into the very fabric of our being. That's why Jesus begins to reveal himself as such during the Philadelphian church age. He, he, the, is the, the, he the one that is holy and true. The Philadelphian age was the age of, of the missionary, the missionary age. Um, you know, I, I, let, me, let me finish my other thoughts and I, I'll go to, to uh, I'll, I'll cover a little bit more on the Philadelphian church age. But the anointing, as I was talking about, you know, God anointed me with the Holy Spirit and power. Why is it necessary? This is the point I wanted to make. Why is it so necessary that a body of people come forward to be anointed with Acts 10.38? Because there are so many people oppressed, sick, 
and brokenhearted, just exactly the way Jesus found them when he came to the earth the first time. When he came to the earth, he found the people, he said, like sheep without a shepherd. They were, they were like scattered sheep without a shepherd, and he had compassion on them, Matthew chapter 9. He went about the synagogues, teaching uh, in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, for he had compassion on them, for he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. The exact condition we see today. So what are we going to have to do? Exactly what he did. Go about healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Why is Luke 4, 18 so important? Why is Acts 10, 38 so important? Because people are so oppressed, so brokenhearted, so sick, they can't hear the message that, that is necessary to empower us, to bring us into the end of the age. Did you hear what I said? Let me say it again another way. There is such oppression out there, even among the church, and even maybe especially among the church. You know, I've said this before and I'll say it again. The first revival is coming in the church. You think God is going to allow us to bring the people in the world into this mess we have right now? Are you kidding? And I'm not being critical when I say this mess. I don't mean, I'm not meaning that in a critical way. I'm saying it because God's about to fix it. God's about to make something beautiful. He's about to make something beautiful. Uh, so, you know, and he, t he, takes, he takes this chaos we have been living in and he makes something beautiful out of it. So I, this church is going to be beautiful. And when, when, and, and when that happens, then we can go out in the world and bring them in when we have something to impart to the lost. God's not going to allow us to bring in this long-awaited harvest only to impart to them traditions and and all the different stuff that we that, that have not gotten us where we need to be. In other words, if what we have been doing has not gotten us where we need to be, why do we think God's going to allow us to bring in the harvest to only give to them to them what has not worked for us? Don't ask me to say that again because I probably couldn't. <laughs> There's something better. And God is going to release his spirit. That's what I'm saying. I saw, I had this experience. It was so encouraging. We were coming out of Pentecost and going over into tabernacles. I saw, I, I, didn't, I didn't experience the Pentecostal experience on the day of Pentecost. I experienced Pentecost at Mount Sinai. It's, all, it's like I was at the mountain. And I saw the lightnings and the thunders and the coals of fire and the, the ground was quaking and the heavens were dripping dew. And I was terrified. I was terrified and I was exhilarated. <laughs> I was wanting it to last forever and I was wanting it to stop right away. <laughs> it was a paradox that can only be experienced in the realm of the spirit. I was so scared I wanted it to stop and I was so exhilarated that I wanted, to, I wanted it to go on forever. And, and, and then I was taken over, over into the promised land. And I've never shared this publicly and I'm, I'm a little reluctant yet to go into it. But, but was the, what was the result was an angel was there and showed me three anointings, three things. But the very first one was the Acts 10.38. And that's when he began to talk to me that the reason we can't really deliver the message we have to deliver to the people is because they are so oppressed they can't hear the message. When some people are sitting even in a pew, you're preaching maybe one of the best messages. And, and I do believe, by, by the way, that truth can release. Preaching truth will in itself provide some form of deliverance. But Jesus himself said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind the brokenhearted, to uh, re the recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners and all of that. So, you know, he himself had to go in his own generation and deal with the issues of the people before he could sit down and begin to talk to them about the kingdom. And so we are today. 
And so it was even in the Philadelphian church age where there had to be the release of power in Sardis. In the Sardis church age, you had enough of the foundations of the faith reestablished. You know, you had Martin Luther and Calvin and Sweeney and uh, uh, Zwini, uh, what's his name? Not, not Zinzendorf. I, he was in the, the Philadelphian age, but Zwini and these other great, I think I said that right. These theologians who were taking advantage of the Gutenberg printing press and were beginning to print the foundations of faith, getting the people back into the basic foundations of Christianity. And that created wars. It created wars. Just the fact that people were beginning to believe the Bible literally created political wars. Germany, it said, loss is up to 40% of its population in the 30-year war. Because this counterfeit religious system that had set itself up not only as a church, but also as a political government. And that was the Roman church of the day. They di dictated how nations were governed. They were. They were as much political, maybe more so political than they were spiritual. And so when all of a sudden that, that, uh, that spiritual authority got challenged, it created political problems. Because now you had some governments that were rebelling against the political authority of the Catholic Church and wars resulted. Bloody, horrible wars resulted. And that makes you wonder why are we wanting to rejoin something that, we, that, that, that people gave their lives to come out of, friends. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I mean, read what happened even in the, to the Reformers, you know. Not even to mention what happened prior to the Reformation, the bloody murders that happened then, but even to the Reformers. I have here in my notes... Uh, the story of one of the great, great heroes of the Reformation. Her name is Anne Askew. She lived, um, um, well, anyway, I, th I thought I had it right here, but Anne Askew. And um, it is believed that she was the great aunt of Sir Isaac Newton. And um, she was very much a part of the Reformation movement. And the church, the church, a priest arrested her. I forget his name now. I have the notes here somewhere, but I can tell enough of the story. You get the idea. You can look it up for yourself. But, but a priest arrests her. her. One of her main things was not only indulgences, but also transubstantiation. The l belief that, it, that, the, that the, the, the priest had the power to literally turn a piece of bread into the literal flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, which, of course, we don't believe. And so she ref she refused to renounce that belief. So they took her down to the to the uh, torture dungeon, and they put her on the rack. I think the only woman to ever be put on the rack, and that's this mechanism where they where they stripped her naked, they humiliated her, placed her on top of this rack, and tied a rope to her foot another rope to the other foot, a rope to the hand, a rope to this hand, and they had these cranks. And they just began to turn the cranks and began to pull her apart. And with each slow crank, her, 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 her wrists would be dislocated. Then her elbows would pop out of the sockets. And then her shoulders would pop out. On each and every limb, all of her wrists, her elbows, her shoulders, literally her hips would pop out of the side. They said they could hear the screams of Anne Askew blocks away until finally someone couldn't bear the screams any longer and ran to a political figure who came down and put a stop to it. But they, they were so heinous. They were so heinous. They literally pulled her apart until they dislocated every joint in her body her body was literally completely lifted off of the rack, wasn't even touching the rack by the, by the tension on her body as the, her bones popped and cracked. 
And when that wasn't bad enough, they released the pain. They released the, the rack so she could come back to rest again, only to do it again. Only to do it again. What kind of man? What kind of man? You know, I'm a little, I'm a Southern guy, <laughs> you know, and I believe in Southern justice. And I, I'm like, I'd like to get a hold of that guy. I would like to take him behind the, behind the building. You know, I know that's not my Christian faith and that's not the way we're supposed to be. But for a man to take a woman and do that to her, he needs to have his fanny whipped. He needed a good whipping. But, you know, praise the Lord, you know, you know, I will... <laughs> We don't do that. We don't do that. <clears throat> I'll tell a funny story. Bobby Connor tells it because I'm getting a little serious. Bobby Connor got saved in a Baptist church in a business meeting. <laughs> Only Bobby could get saved in a business meeting, a Baptist church business meeting. And so because he got saved, he loved the pastor. He really loved the pastor because he led him to the Lord and Bobby had an experience and his sins were forgiven and he was glad to be saved. And so he came, came to everything, came to all the business meetings even. He was a new believer, you know, and knew nothing about church. If there was, at that point in his life, if there was ever anybody that knew nothing about church, it was Bobby Connor, if you knew his story. But he was sitting there, you know, in a business meeting, and every time the pastor that led him to the Lord and Bobby Love would make a motion, this one particular deacon would, would just, in a snooty sort of way, just say, well, I'm going to vote that one down. And they would vote it down. And then he said the pastor that he loved would make another motion to do something for the church, and that same deacon was saying, ah, we're voting that one down too. And Bobby was watching this and he said, finally, the pastor, you know, makes another motion to do something good for the church. You know, and that same deacon says, nah, we're voting that down. Bobby said, I had all of that I could take. He said he jumped up, jumped over two pews, grabbed the deacon by the collar, drew his fist back and said, I'll whip him for you, pastor. <laughs> oh, me. Only, you know, I tell that because Bobby has told it publicly. But sometimes that's what you want to do to somebody that's going to, that would take a woman, you know, and put her on a rack. But of course, you know, being serious, we, that's not the way we respond. The Lord saw that. I'll be very serious now. The Lord saw that. He saw that torture. He saw that injustice. It's kind of interesting because it is believed that Anne Askew was the great aunt of Sir Isaac Newton, who was one of the great scientific but also spiritual minds of the day. Maybe that was God's justice. Maybe that was, maybe her sufferings released something into the earth that had far reaching consequences that would have been a lot better than whipping a priest that needed to be whipped. <laughs> but, but we don't understand God's justice, but these martyrs did. I don't, I'm sure when it was going on, she wasn't too happy about it, but they understood the significance of martyrdom. They understood the significance of persecution. They knew that God was a God of justice. We need to know that God is a God of justice. And not one thing, not one lick from the devil will go unpunished. You can believe that. And if we can ever learn to take our injustices to the courtroom of God and begin to present our case, that's what it says in the book of, of Isaiah, present your case, bring forward your strong argument. Lord, you're the just judge. You are a loving father. And, and the enemy has done this and this. He has invaded this. He has stolen this. And I am bringing my case to you. I present it to you, my Father, to begin to deal with the injustices of what the enemy has done. I wrote a book uh, called Books of Destiny, and I dealt with this extensively. John Paul Jackson read it and said it was one of the, when he first read it, said it was one of the keys. He felt like it would be one of the keys. And of course, he actually ended up teaching it better than I could. But he got that initially from my book. He and I talked about it at length because uh, his firm published the book. And when, when he read it, he called me and we talked about it at length. And he actually sent it to um, R.T. Kendall. 
He sent me that book because of some of the theological things in it to R.T. Kendall. And uh, they told me it was being sent to R.T. Kendall, a brilliant theological mind. And they said they're, they, they're going to, he's going to check it for theological soundness. And I was a little nervous, uh, but I was very happy when they came back and said that he could find nothing wrong with the validity and the soundness of what I had presented, that God is a God of justice, that justice is the key. And it is going to be the thing that's going to launch us. In fact, not only on an individual basis, but all of these martyrs, all of these, these saints that have lost their lives, uh, preaching the gospel. You know, the Philadelphian church age was the age of, of brotherly love. It was the age of, of the missionary age. Why? Because a door had been opened. That's what it says right here. He says that, um, he says, um, to he that is holy and true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts and will shut and no one opens, says this. And so in other words, he had the authority to open and shut doors. And as a result of that, the truth that had been reestablished in Europe, that's, that's what I was leading up to a moment ago, the truth that the reformers of the Sardis church age reestablished through the distribution of the printed material through the Gutenberg press now was in the hands of people. Now the next age was the Philadelphia church age the age of brotherly love, the age of the open door. Now they took that truth to the nations of the earth, including America. So the truth was reestablished, was refounded. They were the found, just not all, but enough, not all, but enough of the foundations of the faith that the, that the just shall live by faith and by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. Uh, that none, you know, not by works that none should boast. And that was the key for, uh, passage for John Wesley, who was the messenger of the Philadelphian church age. He was the predominant voice of the age of the Philadelphia age, which was you know, 1700s, 1800s, leading up into the 1900s. John Wesley lived to be 88. He was a he was a ruthless preacher. When I say ruthless, maybe that's not the best word. He was just a, uh, what can I say? I mean, he, when I say ruthless in a good way, he just, you know, 7,500 miles, no, 250,000 miles on horseback, you know, and preaching five and six times a day, every single day. I mean, he was just an absolute you know, superstar, if you will, for the gospel and carried that gospel message all across not only Europe, England, but also to America and brought revival to America and many things spawned from that. But he was the predominant messenger. He eventually got his brother. Initially, Charles, his brother, didn't get on board. His brother was a little bit more prone to the works mentality. And uh, it took a little doing to get him out of that into the, to the grace perspective. But John Wesley, once he received the message of grace, then he supported that grace with works, but not works unto salvation, works unto rewards. There is a big difference. There's a big difference of doing works unto salvation as a doing works unto rewards. There's no works you can do to earn salvation. Salvation is the gift of God. But when you have the revelation of salvation, then you devote your life to the, to, the, uh, to, to the furtherance of the gospel. You work to carry on the gospel. Then those works become rewards. The Lord Jesus comes from heaven and his rewards are with him. So that what you do on planet earth carries over with you into the age to come. I taught this on one of the webinars. Um... I think we called it, uh, you know, the doctrine of rewards. And we covered it in second, I believe it is second Corinthians three, first Corinthians three, where, where everyone is comes before the judgment seat of Christ and they present their works, some with wood, hay and stubble, some with gold, silver and precious stones. And if our works are more works that are catered to the age in which we're living, which is wood, hay and stubble, they're consumed by fire. At the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is not to be confused with the great white throne judgment. 
The judgment seat of Christ is the, is the doctrine of rewards where, where the Lord takes what you have done on the earth. He refines it. He has to refine it with fire. How much of his heart was in what you did? Simple as that. It's not complicated. How much of his heart was in what you did on planet earth? Now, if you got saved, if you got saved and did nothing, played golf every Sunday, read just enough of your Bible, prayed just enough to keep your salvation, well, you, you're not, there's not going to be much going on on the, on the judgment day for you anyway. <laughs> there's not much to, because, but, there, but then there are other people that have done works, but they can be anointed with another spirit, a counterfeit spirit. And they are thinking they're working for things in the age to come, but they're building in a counterfeit way. Paul taught this. If you question that, go back and watch my webinar. I very carefully lay the scriptures out that show how we can build with wood, hay, and stubble. Second Corinthians 11, another gospel, another Jesus, and, and so forth. And, and then there are those like John Wesley who went out and he built the kingdom. And when he, one day when he stands before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, everything he did over all those many years will be refined by fire. And as a result of that, he will be delegated a measure of rewards, a measure of authority that he will delegate through the millennial age. He will carry his works on him, his rewards on him, crowns of glory, crowns of righteousness, you know, emblems of authority placed upon him so that what you do on the earth will dictate who you are in the age to come. We have to understand that. That is not taught in the church enough. And we're going to have to begin to teach it. But John Wesley would be a poster boy of someone who spent his life building for himself with wood, hay, and stubble so, it was so that when the judgment seat of Christ comes and when the Lord Jesus returns to planet earth, and he begins to rule and reign planet earth for a thousand years and his bride rules and reigns with them. The authority she has will be determined by how much of Christ was formed in them and the works that they did on the earth in, in cohesiveness, in consistency with the very heart of the living God. Now, I want to close with this. I didn't mean to close with a negative, so I may figure out a way to close with a positive. It just so happens, you know, I've just, just kind of been flowing with what I've had. We said that the Church of Philadelphia is the church, was the church of the open door. It's interesting because in the city of Philadelphia, in the first century, the city was notorious, was most well known for their vineyards. And of course, we know that wine came from vineyards. So it's mo it was most no notedly known for its vineyards. Even Rome would send down their, you know, their leaders to bring back some of the grapes for, to, make, to make wine. And as a result of that, they built a temple to the God of wine and revelry, wine, licentiousness, and revelry, by the name of Bacchus. Now, just saying that term ought to um, ring a bell with a lot of people here in the South. And I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. But they worshipped Bacchus, a false deity, who was the, and Dioclesius, who was the goddess of fertility. And those two go hand in hand because of the wineries and because of the vineyards, they felt like if they worshiped this false deity, it blessed their vineyards. And it was kind of interesting, the city of Philadelphia in the first century that was among, that was this city mentioned by the Lord to John while he was on the Isle of Patmos, sat right on a fault line. And there were often earthquakes, but they left, they wouldn't leave the city. <laughs> One reason is because of these flourishing vineyards and, and even their coins 
they have found through archaeology had images of Bacchus, this false deity on it. And, and here's the thing. Philadelphia in the first century was a, a center place for sending out missionaries. It's interesting because Philadelphia church age during the ages of John Wesley was when the Lord opened the doors of Europe and sent out the missionaries led by the Moravians. And I'll maybe in the next, in the next webinar, when I have a little more time, talk some about the Moravians. We, we owe some time to, to the Moravians. These incredibly, these incredibly sacrificial people that led the way Count Zinzendorf, you know, and all of his community of people and these people selling themselves into slavery to win the slaves. But the door was opened and the gospel was sent out and the foundations of faith that you just shall live by faith were being preached to the most remote parts of the earth that had never heard the gospel before. So it was the age of the missionary age. It was the age of the open door. And that is exactly what Philadelphia was in the first century. People would come in from different regions of, uh, of, of Asia, even Rome, Spain, different places. And for Christians, they would stay there for a season to learn the foundations of the faith and then take the foundations of faith back out to their cities. So it as a city was a missionary base. It was a missionary base, just like Philadelphia in the in the 18th century was, you know, for, for Europe and for John Wesley and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield. But here is the thing. When that open door is opened, both sides can go through it. So while we have on the one hand this incredibly beautiful, you know, sacrificial lives of missionaries giving their lives to win slaves and to take the gospel to the remote, remote parts of the earth, others to America. And, and of course, as you all, as we all know, even making its way into the very foundation of our constitution and all of that, the spirit of Bacchus got sent out as well. The spirit of Bacchus, the spirit of wine and revelry got sent out as well. And it found its way right inside the Mississippi River and around right at 1700. Some, some dates date it to 1699. And I have all the notes here. I read so much this morning, I, got, I felt like I got slimed. I really did. When I began to read about Mardi Gras and I began to read about Fat Tuesday, when I began to read about the debauchery that has gone on in the years. It just, I felt a little bit slimed and I just quit reading it, reading it. But it says here, I'll read it to you straight from one of the notes. Mardi Gras is believed to have arrived in North America. Mardi Gras was Fat Tuesday and it was associated with this false deity called Bacchus, the spirit of wine and revelry. Mardi Gras is believed to have arrived in North America on March 3rd, 1699, right about the time, the, right at the time of the Philadelphia Church Age, the age of the open door, when the French-Canadian explorer Pierre Lamoyer Iberville camped about 60 miles downriver from the future site, known, soon to be known as New Orleans, knowing it was Fat Tuesday back in France. Iberville named the spot Point de Mardi Gras and held a gala, a party, a debauchery, wine and revelry. A few years later, the French soldiers and soldiers and settlers feasted and wore masks as part of the Mardi Gras festival in the newly founded city of Mobile. Present day Alabama, to this day, Mobile claims to have been the oldest annual Mardi Gras celebration in the United States. What a shame. What a tragedy that, that, uh, that Mobile would claim such a thing. I love Mobile. I love where I live. I love Alabama. The Lord told me years ago to move my identity to Alabama. I've been, my identity has been in Alabama for 30 years. I love Alabama. 
But I tell you one thing I cannot love about some things that go on here in the South. I cannot love Mardi Gras. It has its roots right here in the Church of Philadelphia where they built a false temple to this god of wine and revelry, revelry, wine, wine, revelry, and licentiousness is what it was called in combination with Diocletius, which was the goddess of fertility. And it was ugly. And that spirit, that spirit made its way and set its hooks up right here in our hometown, right here in Mobile, and eventually over into New Orleans. And whenever you see the parade of, of Bacchus, it is not a good thing. I'm going to make a statement here, and I don't know how my Christian friends from Mobile and New Orleans will respond, but I'm going to say it because I felt like the Lord told me I had to say it. But, but a Christian has no business having anything to do with Mardi Gras. A born-again, spirit-filled Christian has no place at Mardi Gras. You could not get me to take some of those beads and put them on my mirror of my car for any amount of money. Because as those parades go down the streets and the people are jumping up and down in jubilation and even some of, even some of the, uh, the, the um, cars, you know, the things in the parade have, 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 have demonic images on them. Some say the spirit of debauchery and, and, and people are just jumping up and down and basically worshiping demons. They are. I, I'm sorry if it offends people, but I'm not apologizing. I'm not apologizing. I'm just saying I, I don't. I'm sorry if it does. But, but we as a Christian have no business having anything to do. We need to pray that our land can be free of that spirit. And here again, I'm, I'm not strong enough yet just to go as far as I need to go on this. But, but I hope my Christian friends will begin to do a little study about the history of Mardi Gras, the spirit behind Mardi Gras, the, the debauchery, the, the, the revelry. Well, you know, even f just the idea of Fat Tuesday where you just go out and get pl plastered drunk and do all the kind of bad stuff you, you, you want to do because the next day is Ash Wednesday and you get, you get absolvance. What, what kind of theology is that? But I, I pray that, uh, that the church of Mobile and Baldwin County and New Orleans can begin to have a, the true born again, spirit filled church can have a revelation and, and do our research and find out the origins of this because it came out of those regions when there was also the release of the spirit of the missionary age. And I, I hope and pray that we can begin to deal with that, or at least just not participate in it, just not have anything to do with it. There are some things that a Christian just doesn't need to have, shouldn't, shouldn't have anything to do with. And this is one of them. There, there is no place in a Mardi Gras parade for a Christian. I know the children and love it. They get the moon pies and all of that. I, I know that. But, but it's a small sacrifice to honor God and just simply not participate in something that is dedicated to demons. It's just the truth. We just need to be a little wiser. This is the 21st century. We're living in the age when the Lord Jesus is about to return. We need to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. We need to be full of holiness and truth. Things we could get away with in times past, not so much today. God may have winked an eye at that in times past, but prophetic voices right and left are coming forward and saying, this is something that Christians have no business being a part of because it has nothing to do with Christianity. In fact, it is the very worship of demons and a Christian needs to stay as far away from it as possible. So I hope you can understand my heart on that. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll pick back up next week. I, I did end up this thing a little, a little heavy, but this is what I'll talk about next time. To him that overcomes, I will make him a pillar and the temple of my God. 
and he will and he will not go out from it any more and I will write upon him the name of my God. What does that mean? You'll be a pillar in the very temple of God. You'll not stand by a pillar. You will be a pillar. <laughs> that means you're in the very presence of God perpetually. You'll be a pillar in the temple of God. Not only that, he'll write his name on you. So when we overcome, now just think about that for a minute. Which would you rather do, go to a Mardi Gras parade or become a pillar in the temple of God? Because maybe, maybe that's some of what we have to overcome. <laughs> we have to overcome the spirit of the age. We have to overcome the spirit of the age to become an overcomer. And not everyone gets the blessings of the overcomer. You have to overcome to get the blessings of the overcomer. You know, people think, well, I'm a Christian. I get, I'm going to be a pillar in the temple of God. Not necessarily. Not if you don't overcome. You must overcome. It says, you, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of God and you'll not go out from it anymore. And I'll write upon you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. That's a lot of names. <laughs> wow. That means that if you overcome, you become a pillar in the temple of God and you automatically... Your home is no longer Alabama or Oregon or Washington or any place else. Your home is Jerusalem because you are a part of the temple of the living God and he has written his name upon you and everywhere you go on planet earth, every human being, every spirit, everything will see the very name of God written upon you. And they will know that you, you aren't just a believer in God. You are a part of God because he has written his name on you. What an amazing, we're going to talk about that in the next webinar. One of the most fantastic blessings that will be given to those that overcome. Oh, I pray this has been a blessing to you. Covers some heavy duty territory, but we have to, we have to. These are serious times. It's time to be a man. It's time to gird up your loins. It's time to know what you believe. It's time to be ready to fight for what you believe it is. It's not time to be passive. It's not. You know what? If you're easily offended, you need to go back into your secret place and find, and find some courage. Because if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you're going to be a soldier for what is truth, if you're going to be a steward of the spirit of truth, you're going to offend and you're going to have to fight for what you believe, not, not with, um, uh, in, in way, not with, with haughtiness or bad attitudes or uh, not with this. You know, you're going to have to fight with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You're going to have to fight with spiritual warfare. You're going to have to fight the fight that Paul did. This is the last days. This is the last days. Everything, oh, everything has been un unhinged. <laughs> it's poured in. You know, we're in it. We're in this thing. And, and the enemy is not pulling punches. And we, we need to become what we're called to be in order to bring this generation to the Lord Jesus. Because we don't have a hundred years. I don't know how many years we have, but it's not a hundred. I, I believe there are people living that will see the Lord return. That's my belief. That's my belief. Maybe me too. I don't know. But, uh, but we need to know what we believe and be willing to, to make a stand. To make a stand. That's all he tells us to do. Just, just, just stand up and say, you know what? I'm going to make a stand today. One of my favorite characters in the Bible is a man called Shama. Uh, it's in Second Samuel five, I think, or second Samuel 23. I always get the two confused. One is the spirit of breakthrough. I think that's five. So this is six, second Samuel 23. His name is Shama. And he is the one that, you know, the Israelites had planted this beautiful field of lentils. And it was the practice of the Philistines that they would let the Israelites build, uh, you know, grow the harvest. And then 
just as the time of harvest came, they would come swooping down with their armies and steal the harvest away from the Philistine, away from the Israelites and, and leave just enough for them to barely get by, half starving to death. And one day the, there was this field of ripe lentils and over the hill came the Philistines, this whole garrison of Philistines. We're not sure of the number of them, but it was quite a few of them. And all the Bible says all the Israelites fled, but, but Shammah. Shammah maybe took a couple of steps and he just decided, you know what, not today. I ain't running. And the Bible says he took a stand in the lentil field. And I, and I feel like what he said was, you know what, I've run for the last time. I'm not going to run again. One of two things are about to happen today. I'm about to die and go be with my God or God is going to give me a victory, one or the other. Either way, I, I'm a, it's a win-win. But I, one thing I'm not going to do, I'm not going to run. Period. So if God wants me on planet Earth, He's going to have to support me and give me strength in my arm and I'll whip every one of those Philistines coming over that hill and I'm going to defend this lentil field because I'm not going to be a coward. I've been a coward for the last time. And I feel like that's truth. And that we're going to be called upon as Shama was to take our stand in this lentil field of truth and defend it against everything that would try to steal it. Well, I pray blessings upon you. I pray the Lord would open your eyes with spiritual wisdom. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, make the people hungry to desire to understand these spiritual principles. Lord, I release the spirit of holiness and I release the spirit of truth. You are holy and true. So I release those attributes of yourself upon these people. Lord, I pray, I pray that this army comes out of the caves, that you anoint them with courage, that you would anoint them with valor, that you would raise up in this generation some of the greatest champions that have ever walked planet Earth. I mean that sincerely. I know they're out there and I call them forth, these great hidden champions that God has prepared since before the foundation of the world to begin to carry this gospel to the nations of the earth, a standard of truth, plumb line revelation, released in planet earth. Release that to these people, I ask, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.